Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In parts one and two of our Machiavelli of Westeros series, we discussed Tywin's early life, starting with his childhood, leading up to his tenure as Hand, and all the way to his resignation and the tourney at Harrenhal. In both videos, we alluded to the idea that for several reasons, Rhaegar and Tywin gravitated towards one another, and eventually began working together to remove Eris from the throne, one way or another. In part one, we discussed the defiance at Duskendale, which seems to have been a plot formed by Tywin and Rhaegar that they hoped would end with Eris's demise and Rhaegar on the throne. Barristan Selmy's act of valor is one that no one, not even Tywin, could have anticipated and thwarted their efforts. After Duskendale, Tywin continued as hand, until the Mad King announced Jaime would be a Kingsguard, upon which time Tywin resigned for health reasons. Meanwhile, Rhaegar wed Elia Martell of Dorne and had a daughter with her. When he presented Rhaenys at court, his father shunned the child, saying she smelled Dornish. Not too long after Rhaegar's visit to King's Landing, Rhaegar and Tywin made common cause against the Mad King yet again, as the shadow hosts behind the great tourney at Harrenhal. What took place over the ten days of the tourney we can only speculate. But given that George R. R. Martin has gone on the record as stating that so much took place in these ten days, it would fill the contents of an entire George R. R. Martin-style book, I'm going to assume that some shit went down. So, coming up in this video, we are going to briefly touch upon some of the events that we know took place at the tourney, delve into the events leading up to Robert's Rebellion, and all that transpired in between. So, let's do this. We're going to pick up right where we left off, at Harrenhal. Now we already delved into what the circumstances were leading up to the tourney, and what we believe the purpose of it was, which was to provide a venue for the king's behavior to be exposed to as many great lords as possible, in order to plant the seed in their minds that Eris was no longer fit to rule. Their plan did hit one snag, however. It is not clear what exactly made Rhaegar do what he did in crowning Lyanna, but I think it's safe to assume that it wasn't part of Tywin and Rhaegar's plan. Maybe it was prophecy-driven. Maybe it was love at first sight. Whatever it was, we may never know unless George decides to tell us. But the fact that there doesn't seem to be any tangible gain that could be had from crowning Lyanna other than backlash from the Martells, who were among Rhaegar's staunchest allies. The only political victory I can see possibly coming from publicly insulting the Martells is it might endear you to Mace Tyrell, who absolutely hates them because of Oberyn's inadvertent crippling of his eldest son. I guess if you're thinking that a war might be on the horizon, that could be viewed as a calculated move. As Lord Hightower, one of the Tyrell bannermen, can field more men than Dorn and the North combined, and that's not even including the rest of the Reach. The World of Ice and Fire suggests that Eris's cronies thought Rhaegar crowned Lyanna to curry favor with the North, but given that Brandon had to be restrained from confronting Rhaegar, and even Ned was pissed, I think it is safe to say that it wasn't done for that purpose. And if that was their plan, then it wasn't a very good one. Even if either of those were their ultimate goal of his crowning of Lyanna, neither of them are sure things, and definitely doesn't seem like it would be worth the political risk associated with scorning your wife in public when the purpose of you being there is to appear the perfect ruler 
by comparison to your sick, sadistic father. It seems highly likely that Tywin would be displeased to hear what his perfect prince had done, to potentially spoil what was most likely years of planning. But his thirst for revenge still needed quenching. Rhaegar's actions at Harrenhal could become an obstacle in getting the people to cry out for their noble Rhaegar to save them. And as Machiavelli once said, You ought not to keep faith when by so doing it would be against your interest, and when the reasons which made you bind yourself no longer exist. Tywin, being the Machiavelli of Westeros, would likely begin to look at the situation in a very different light. Where he once saw Rhaegar as a sure thing, Rhaegar's actions would likely make Tywin view him as a potential liability, which means he would need to think of a way to hedge his bets. Keeping one foot in and one foot out could easily be accomplished, as no one even knew that he was working with Rhaegar. So Tywin could easily make plans without Rhaegar ever knowing, placing Tywin in a very powerful position. While calculating his next move, Tywin could just sit back patiently, waiting to see if the seeds they tried planting at Harrenhal would bear any fruit. And bear fruit they did. This is a perfect time to point out that following Harrenhal, Rhaegar and a very pregnant Elia returned to Dragonstone, where she gave birth to their son, Aegon. Shortly after the birth of Aegon, Rhaegar left Dragonstone, and his whereabouts were unknown until he showed up in King's Landing towards the end of Robert's Rebellion. So where the hell was he? Well, according to the timeline we calculated for this period, from the time Rhaegar took to the road with a group of companions, to his arrival in King's Landing before the Battle of the Trident, almost two years had gone by. Now, there is not a lot of information for us to draw on, so all we can do is try to draw some sort of logical series of events based on what is known. To us, it seems likely that after the birth of Aegon, one of the first places he would have gone is to meet up with Tywin to discuss what to do next. After that, it seems nearly impossible that Rhaegar would not seek out his only living relative that he knew he could trust, Maester Aemon, to see what he thought. Based on the fact that Maester Aemon is aware of Rhaegar's thoughts about the prince that was promised prophecy from when Rhaegar was young and when he was older, it certainly appears that the two of them had been in contact throughout his life. Given that this is treason they are talking about here, and the man on the other end of the message is blind and needs to have a steward read it to him, sending a raven will not do. So he'd have to go there himself. Given Eris's incompetence and cruelty, it is hard to imagine anyone counseling Rhaegar to do anything other than removing Eris from the throne, especially if there's a reasonable plan in place to get it done. So it is likely that Aemon would have told Rhaegar just that. If he could find a relatively peaceful way to get it done, the realm would benefit greatly from it. So, Rhaegar began his trip south, down the King's Road, where he ran into his kryptonite, Lyanna. Lyanna would have been part of the large party traveling south to River Run for her brother Brandon's wedding. Rhaegar and his companions would likely have been traveling faster than a large party such as that, with lords and ladies traveling in comfort at a leisurely pace, much like Cersei's traveled to and from Winterfell in A Game of Thrones. So, Rhaegar catches up, passes them on the road, and carries on. House Derry is one of the most loyal and dedicated houses in Westeros to the Targaryens, and with one son in the Kingsguard and another serving as Master at Arms in the King's Landing. This makes it seem likely that Rhaegar would stay there when he got to the Riverlands. Then the Stark party started filing past most likely to meet Ned coming down from the Vale, because that is the only logical reason to take a route that goes anywhere near Harrenhal on your way to Riverrun. And this is where Rhaegar 
does what many men have done before him and what many men have done since. He did something asininely stupid over a girl. Now, how everything went down is a complete mystery. But I think it is safe to say that Rhaegar didn't just walk up, swing Lyanna over his shoulder, and ride off in broad daylight. So the story told seems to point to the idea that they were seen together by at least one person. The reason I say this is because when Brandon arrived to meet his father and party, he was informed of Lyanna's disappearance, and then immediately took off for King's Landing. This implies that a credible source saw them together, as it would be hard to imagine that Brandon would ride off to court demanding the crown prince's head, unless he was pretty sure that's what happened. So whatever was told to Rickard and Brandon gave him cause enough to ride to King's Landing in hot pursuit of the prince and his sister. Clearly we are on the same page as most other fans, and think that it was no abduction, but more of a consensual getaway, likely inspired by the willfulness of Lyanna, who had all but indicated to Ned that she really didn't want to marry Robert. The Starks would have extensively searched the area, which coincidentally is almost the exact place where Arya went missing after Nymeria bit Joffrey and she beat him up. Ned must really hate that place. Anyways, clearly they did not find them, and the reason that we think they didn't is because they were looking in the wrong direction. Lyanna was said to be an excellent rider, so she would be skilled enough to head south, loop wide around the Stark party, and head north, back to Winterfell, which is the very last place anyone would think to look for them. Given the fact that most of the Stark bannermen were likely en route to River Run, or in the Riverlands with the Stark party that was headed there, the North, a region which is sparsely populated to begin with, would be easy to navigate without being seen. If Tywin hadn't already began seriously considering options other than Rhaegar, it is impossible that he wouldn't start at this point. Eris then did what Eris was known to do, and did something so ridiculously sadistic that a rebellion began, and Rhaegar had disqualified himself from being able to capitalize on it. Tywin is a prudent man, so he wasn't going to throw in the towel with Rhaegar altogether, in case the Targaryens emerged victorious. But he most certainly was not going to throw his weight behind a cause that he likely viewed as a 50-50 proposition either. So he sat back and waited. Based on the fact that before leaving for the Trident, Rhaegar insisted to his father that he send Tywin a raven requesting aid, and he told Jaime Lannister that, quote, when the battle's done, I mean to call a council. Changes will be made. We believe that he talked to Tywin beforehand, because in order to have the authority to call a council to remove his father from the throne, Rhaegar would have to seize control of King's Landing first. Now, Tywin is a man that likes to set himself up to win, regardless of the outcome. So upon receiving this raven, which we believe was the likely prearranged signal to act, Tywin began moving his 12,000 men towards King's Landing. Revenge was finally going to be his. If Rhaegar won, Tywin would arrive in King's Landing and pledge loyalty, stating that he and his men were there to help protect the king. With 12,000 Lannister men inside the castle walls when Rhaegar returns to the city, Rhaegar and Tywin would have control over significantly more men than the Gold Cloaks have in their ranks. And as we learned from what happened to Ned in A Game of Thrones, in a fight for the throne within the castle walls, he who has the numbers wins. If Rhaegar was to lose at the Trident, like he did, Tywin has placed himself in the position to hand-deliver King's Landing to the incoming King Robert, with all the dirty work of disposing of the royal family already done. In other words, Tywin gets his revenge either way. Coming up in part four of our Tywin Lannister, the Machiavelli of Westeros series, we will pick up with Tywin at the start of A Game of Thrones.
and illustrate just how many events Tywin's shadowy fingerprints were all over. Also, keep an eye out later this week for part three of our Faceless Men series. Until then, stay tuned, like, and subscribe for more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by the Order of the Green Hand.